Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest podcast series, My Life as a Pro. Um, my name is Freem Jishi. I'm the content director with QT2 Systems, and our featured guest today is, is a retired pro athlete, Lindsay Corbin. Welcome, Lindsay. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on and being our first guest in this series. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no pressure <laughs> for <laughs> no. either of us. <laughs> no, definitely not. So, I mean, you had an, a long career, which you just retired about a year ago now, yeah. right? So I want you to like, take me back to the, to the very beginning, your first triathlon, when was it? And just, you know, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I um, got into triathlon. I was studying exercise science at the university of Montana and a lot of the people in the exercise lab and the friends I was associated with were talking about that in their spare time, they were on this triathlon club team. And so I joined just the local club team, the University of Montana tri team. And that was kind of my first entry to triathlon. And I had a pretty quick trajectory. Um, I think I did basically like a year of local races. And then the next year I jumped right into wildflower, our whole club team road trip to wildflower, like camped on the way down, slept in the dirt, used our borrowed gear, woke up, did the collegiate race. And I feel like we won the collegiate division. Like we were always a really strong club team um, of note is Ben Hoffman was also on the team with me. So I was college teammates with Ben Hoffman. Um, and then the next year I was getting ready to finish school and I was trying to think of something cool to commemorate being done with school. And a lot of people in the exercise physiology lab were training for Ironman Coeur d'Alene. So I kind of signed up for it, not knowing a ton what I was gonna, getting myself into. And I was still an age grouper at the time. And um, I'm just gonna get right into like why I turned pro is that um, I signed up for this Ironman obviously a very intimidating endeavor task. I didn't know what I was getting into. And so it was the first time that I actually followed a training plan because I was like, you need a training plan. You're going to have to be prepared. 140.6 is a very long ways to go. So as I applied myself to that training plan, I got more and more fit. And when you're a newbie to the sport, your trajectory, just, you know, your learning curve is so huge. Um, so we went to wildflower that year and I had like the race of my life. I set the amateur course record and I think I would have been third among the pros. So I knew I was like pretty fit and I technically could qualify for my pro card, but that wasn't even on my radar. And, um, Ironman Coeur d'Alene was getting closer and closer and I didn't come from a swim background. So I didn't really learn to swim until basically I started triathlon. Like I could swim at the lake, but I didn't know what laps were, goggles, a swim workout. And so one of my biggest hesitations for Ironman Coeur d'Alene was the swim, because at the time they did these mass start swims with 2000 people. And I was scared to death of like having to swim with 2000 people. And you see these like epic pictures and videos of the gun going off and people getting trampled and we were on a training ride about to start our taper, I feel like. And some of my college buddies were joking with me and they were like, you know, if you get your pro card, you get a head start. <laughs> so basically two weeks later, not only did I race my first Ironman, but it was my first pro race. So I wrote to USAT, got my pro license emailed Heather Fuhrer. I switched my race entry from age group athlete to pro. And literally that was, that was it. That was in 2006. And again, I had the race of my life completely exceeded my expectations. And I qualified for Ironman Hawaii as a pro in my first Ironman. And then looking into 2007, I basically went to my husband and my family. And I said, like, I really want to give this a go, give me a year of racing. And if I don't make any money, then I'll figure out what I'm going to do for work or for a job. And um, again, I just kept building on that momentum and was able to make a career out of it. And so, yeah, the, the rest really was history, but Ironman Coeur d'Alene in 2006 was where it all started. Wow. <laughs> all so because I didn't want to do a mass swim start. <laughs> well, that's that's one way out of it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so 
your performance sent a wildflower. That was what got you the, your pro card. Is that yeah, I had done a few local races and I forget what the criteria was. You had to be within like X percentage of the winning time. And I think, yeah, that was pretty much just it. And so, yeah, it was just a matter of applying online, um, filling out the paperwork, they check your results and then you pay a fee and you get a card in the mail and they say, good luck. <laughs> okay. So other than not wanting to start in the field, the past yeah. field, was there, I mean, I mean, there must have been something else that motivated you to want to, to give it a try as a pro. Yeah. Yeah, I was really, I mean, obviously I was intrigued by the Ironman distance, but I was really fascinated by the Ironman, which was Ironman Hawaii. And my personality has like always been all or nothing. So not only did I really want to do an Ironman, but um, I really, really wanted to race in Kona. And I think that that was probably my biggest confliction with like racing as an age grouper versus a pro at Coeur d'Alene, because I... I mean, I, you don't have confidence at all really before your first Ironman, but I kind of thought my chances of going to Kona are going to be like way greater if I race as an age grouper versus a pro. And it's pretty cool now looking back, because I think when I raced as a pro at that Ironman Coeur d'Alene, I threw Hawaii thoughts out the window and it was a very process goal oriented day. I wasn't like, I wasn't expecting to win. I wasn't expecting really to qualify and um, then it just kind of happened, but I would definitely say that I was motivated by thoughts of going to Hawaii. Um, but early on, like, I didn't think this was going to be a thing. I ended up racing 17 years as a professional triathlete. And I never on that day in 2006 was like, I'm going to make a go of this. This is what I'm going to do for the next like 10, 15 years. And even Hawaii that first year, I thought was a one and done. I was like, I'm going to go do this race. I actually um, got hit by a car uh, maybe a month before the race and went through the wind, the car windshield and broke my clavicle. And like, I had no business racing, but I was like, this is it. This is the only time I'm going to do Kona. I don't care if I have a broken clavicle, I'm going to go do it. And I, and I went and did it. And then there's something about Kona. <laughs> I, think, I think it needs a warning label because of course, the minute I finished was like, I've got to come back and do this again. So um, Kona was definitely like a driving force early on. But, um, you know, the the beauty of Ironman is like, whether you're pro or not, you're constantly able to like, seek improvements, get better. And I would say that ultimately, that became the driver for me was like, how good can you get? How can you improve? Um, but that was a big motivation for me after the like, Kona fanfare was over was this motivation of, of constantly improving so what was it like to I mean to show up to Kona <laughs> as your second Ironman right yeah your second pro race and to be there on the starting line with with the best of the you know the best of the best that that first year what did it feel like for you yeah, I just think probably now looking back it feels like I probably had my jaw on the floor the entire time of just like you're seeing the people you read about in the magazines. And then, I mean, obviously the internet and social media wasn't a thing back then. So you just could see it on TV and read about it, but it lived up to like this persona and the images and the, um, yeah, the buzz, you know, I mean, you definitely have to like see it to believe it. And I did like every, I mean, I shouldn't say I did everything wrong. I actually had like an okay race, but I soaked it all up because it was like, this is the only time I'm going to be there. Like I was at the parade of nations. I was in, the, you know, in the ocean every day. I was on elite drive. I was riding my bike on the queen K. So I think I was just like, what a cool opportunity. What a spectacle. And it's like fascinating. And I know this is the direction this was going, but like, I look at now, like nothing has changed. Right. Like, I think if you were to plop, 20 whatever old I was 22 23 year old Lindsay down in Kona now for the first time those feelings would be exactly the same like that there's just something magical about Hawaii and I think if it was my first time this year I would be just as starstruck of what a spectacle it is and what a special place mm -hmm. so all right so you did you said you came back and said, all right, give me a year. So yeah. tell, me, tell me about that year. Cause obviously the year must've gone pretty well. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so I was able to um, secure a few small partnerships that year. Um, I initially the year before in 2006, I had been accepted as an age group athlete on the Timex team. So I kind of already had my foot in the door a little bit with sponsorship and I think being part of a club team or not club, but being part of like the Timex team um, gave you a bit more spotlight than if you were just a regular age group athlete. So I did turn pro, but I still was racing under the Timex, um, you know, logos. And I think you had a lot of sponsor events with the other sponsors that sort of supported the team. So I got to meet people through that. And I actually had been approached by a sports agent and like the whole thing is just crazy. Like, what am I doing talking to a sports agent? <laughs> and he was a great gentleman, Chris McCrary. And so in 2007, he was like, I think there's opportunities for you outside of this Timex team. And very fortunately, he um, had sort of hooked me up or introduced me with Cliff Bar. So I did sign with Cliff Bar. And then um, coincidentally, one of my friends in college was a shoe sales rep for Saucony. And she sort of introduced me to Saucony. And so Saucony signed me. And so I had, um, and then, oh yeah. And then I think I also worked with maybe Orbea Bikes and that was a carryover from the Timex team. Um, but all of the partnerships, like, particularly Saucony and Cliff Bar, I carried my entire career. And it was so funny because in 2007, I could be like, I was sponsored, but Saucony gave me six free boxes of running shoes. Like it was the most baby tiniest sponsorship ever. And Cliff Bar was like, all you can eat Cliff Bars okay. and maybe we'll cover travel for some races, but they were very small contracts that maybe included some incentives or bonuses if you were to to win a race um but I am like forever grateful because I feel like a bit a bit of luck came into it because both of those companies grew our partnership throughout throughout our history together so I ended up being sponsored by both Cliff Bar and Saucony for 15 years or seven 16 I guess the full run and then um Trek bikes came in later but um, yeah, so I had very little sponsorship money and it was just kind of like you're racing to um, make some money and see what you can do of it. And I do recall that I raced the Vineman 70.3 and I kind of thought like, I'm, I'm hot stuff. Like I did my first Ironman as a pro, qualified for Kona. And um, I mentioned earlier, I did not come from a swim background and the gun went off at Vineman 70.3 and I may as well just been standing still in the water. Like the entire field left me. I raced by myself all day. I was so far back in the field. And I remember that they would, that was a very humbling day for me that like these pro women, like there's, I, and the field was very small too. Like fields were a lot smaller than there were more races to pick from. And yeah, it was just like a race by myself all day. And um, that was a real wake up call. But again, like for me, that was a motivator of like, I just did terrible and that's not, I'm just a competitor. That's not where I want to be. So how can I keep pushing forward and, and try to improve? Um, and then I raced Lake Placid that year was my like Ironman of choice. And I had a huge breakthrough that day. I, um, blew up on the bike <laughs> I remember climbing the three bears, um, going back to, to town. And I was like, how am I going to do a second loop? And, but, um, the beauty of it is like an Ironman, such a long day. And I ended up running a three Oh five marathon, I think. So all of a sudden it kind of clicked that like, you can be having a really bad day and then you can be having an incredible day. And with a three Oh five marathon, 2007, I was able to run up to a Kona slot. So we were going back. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay. how did you, I mean, as, as a pro, how did you set your race schedule? I think at the time it was like, let me pick courses that I'm intrigued by that would suit my strengths. I never really was, I, I never actually was concerned about money. Um, I feel a bit fortunate about that. I received no help from my parents though. I had no external support. It was definitely 
um, what you make is what you're living off of. So I don't want people to come under the illusion that I was on a full ride scholarship by any means. But I, for me throughout, even when I was making really great money, money was never a driver for me. And I think that that was helpful, you know, that you're not, that I didn't feel the pressure. Like it was just, I was doing it for enjoyment and because I loved it. And because of this process of like trying to get better. Um, so a lot of my races, I just picked of like, I grew up as a ski racer. I grew up in the mountains. I knew I was a strong cyclist. So it was like, all right, let's pick races with these hard bike courses, these iconic bike courses that you hear about. And then for me, my North light was always Kona. So it was like, how can I build a season around qualifying for Kona and then getting to Kona? Um, and then I would pick races that sounded fun. I always, which is kind of weird because I grew up in the mountains. You'd think I'd love the snow, but I always race better in the heat. So if it was a warm race, um, I was more drawn to that. So picking races, I guess that would suit my strengths. And, um, I didn't really start, I guess I started traveling maybe in 2009 or 10 outside the U S but early on because of, I guess maybe it was financial reasons or maybe it was intimidation, but I would, I raced a lot in the U S, um, early on. So and how many Ironman distance races would you do per season? I started out doing about two a year. Um, so usually like a Kona qualifier and then Kona. And then I think in 2000, maybe nine or 10, I, I started going to three a year. And I never, I would fluctuate between two and three. But I never did more than three a year. Um, and then particularly, which I'm sure we'll get to later, but I started working with Jesse in QT2 in 2013. And um, I think we talked a lot about the longevity in the sport and that I would see a lot of my competitors doing like four Ironmans and three wins in a year. And of course I would be jealous of that. And I would question it and be like, can I do it? And Jesse would be like, well, you can do it, but what's going to happen a year or two years from now. So I credit Jesse a lot for like, and the entire QT2 program, I think of, of having these, this long-term vision of like, you know, don't go after the candy on the shelf. That's, <laughs> it seems good, but you have to um, have a longevity and, and in order to like make gains and have improvement, it's about consistency. So um, yeah, I would say I was in the two to three a year window and I definitely love Ironman. I think Ironman suited me more than the shorter stuff. And I went about it in an unconventional way. I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, so you missed all the short stuff, the speed, the development. And um, I definitely did, but it's, um, it was a bit, I didn't know, you know, like I think had I known in 2006 that I was going to have this long career, maybe I would have approached things differently. But for me, it was, I loved, um, the endurance. I loved the mental fortitude that was needed for Ironman. I loved like what a journey it was, whether it was like the six or seven hour bike rides, like those were my jam. And so, um, for me, I, I never really questioned doing the short course development, but, um, if I had a crystal ball, I would definitely say that the athletes that maybe aren't racing as much Ironman and are putting in that developmental, um, if they want a long span career, um, you look at that and you're like, I kind of wish I'd done that, but, um, I don't have any regrets. So Iron Man, it was for this girl. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you were saying that your first, when you did Corden Lane, it was off of a written training program, basically. Right. So yeah. when did you go from the written training program to hiring your first coach? Yeah. So I did the written program for Corda Lane and then I qualified and was like, I need a coach. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And I, I called up Lance Watson because I'd read about him in the magazines <laughs> and he's um, a coach out of Canada who I'm still great friends with. I actually would say we're better friends now than when he coached me. Um, and it's funny now to like, look back on how I was as a, as a first athlete being coached. But um, yeah, my first coach was Lance Watson and I worked with him for four years and he took me on a, a huge trajectory. Um, and then after Lance Watson, I worked with Matt Dixon, a purple patch. And I worked with Matt Dixon for four years. And then I was on this four year cycle where I would get this itch of like, I need something new. And then um, I called up Jesse Kropelnicki um, after that 
that. Yeah. So basically eight years and I called Jesse. Okay. So when you, when you called Jesse, you had now been racing as a pro for eight years. Yeah. And, um, what kind of, I mean, in that sort of eight year time frame, what do you think your, where your, your strongest race is? Any big notable finishes from yeah. that? Um, yeah, so I had finished fifth at Ironman Hawaii as among the pros in 2008. And that was kind of a day once again, we're exceeding expectations here. If you notice a the theme, but I came off the bike in third place, had all these cameras around. They didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, just a magical day. It was a very windy day. So I think it suited the strong cyclists and, naivety was in my favor and so yeah I was um fifth in 2008 and I think I had won a couple Ironmans I think I'd won Coeur d'Alene and Arizona a couple times and then um but I was just I was seeking a change and my number I mean I'd heard about QT2 I'd raced Kate Snow a bunch remarkable runner. So I always kind of was motivated by what was Kate doing. I, I, I felt that like my run could be my weapon. And so that was kind of, and I'd met Jesse at Timberman and he was always really nice and approachable. But for me, my number one criteria at that point, when I was searching for a coach was that I wanted someone that genuinely cared. It was like, I didn't care what the program was. I didn't care if it was like high mileage, low mileage, speed, squad environment. But for me, it was really important that like, I want someone that's going to stay up in the middle of the night if I'm racing in Europe and track my track my race. I want someone that if I have a bad workout is going to understand it and not just, you know, ignore it or not pay attention. And so that was kind of one of my biggest things on my list of like what I was looking for. And then the other thing was I really wanted someone that was going to pay attention to detail. <laughs> I had no idea what I was stepping into with QT2 <laughs> that literally no stone would be left unturned. But um, yeah, I think I had a few conversations with Jesse and he was like, you should fly out. Let's spend a weekend together and see if this is a good fit. We'll look at what your limiters were. Like I hadn't even heard the word limiter. So <laughs> I was like, we're, we're going to have a lot of things to work on here. But yeah, I flew out to Situate and stayed with Jesse and Chrissy. And I knew, you know, within a, an hour or two of being there that like, this was someone that was going to pay attention to the details and someone that was going to genuinely care and be invested and not just I mean, I think I look back now and I realize that maybe people were like, she's young, good looking, fast, and kind of took advantage of some of those things. And I wanted someone that was going to see value in me beyond those things. And uh, like 110% over and over, like I, I got that from Jesse. And um, yeah, you can't, like no training plan can make up for that, I don't think. So QT2 it was. Yay. <laughs> So, so when you called Jesse, was he surprised? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, if you know Jesse, he'd be like, no, she was yeah. going to call me up. <laughs> <laughs> so he probably would say no, he was not surprised, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so but maybe he was, I don't know. You have to ask him. We can like insert a little bubble of his. <laughs> <laughs> right. He kept it cool anyway. Yeah. But, um, so I mean, so you came on and Jesse's obviously, I mean, incredibly detail oriented in everything that he does. Yeah. Um, it, so did you feel that? I mean, did you feel that difference as an athlete when you, when you switched? And so yeah, I mean, there was, it was definite, like we're flipping your world upside down. <laughs> Things are going to be very different than they were before. Um, but it was also like, I loved it. It was super motivating. I loved the spreadsheets. I loved being able to track everything. This is nuts to think, but like I'd never trained with a heart rate monitor before. <laughs> so everything prior to that had been perceived effort. And anyone that knows me is like, I have like my husband jokes that I don't have a break on my floorboard. <laughs> so it's like, I remember actually Jesse's like, all right, we're going to track some runs. This was even maybe before I flew out, it was in November, I think. And um, like go on an easy run. And I went on an easy run at seven minute, 20 pace or something. <laughs> and 
in training peaks or at the time it was I forget the name of what their old platform was but he wrote back and uh, yeah darrow yeah. good good move to training peaks but anyways it was like 720 is not your easy pace and i was like no i swear it was easy he's like let's slow it down the next day it was like 735s he's like you're still going too fast i'm like i can't run any slower <laughs> And then that's when it was like, you're putting a heart rate on and here's your cap. And it was just like agony. But like I said, I think that that was probably the biggest difference for me was like nothing in the past had been measurable. Mm -hmm. um, I'd used a power meter, but there was no real direction with it. It was like, let's go easy. Let's go hard. But for someone like me, I don't know easy. It's like, all I know is let's just go fully hard. So. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's so how I'm just curious, how slow did he get you down to on your easy runs? I think he talked me into about eights to eight fifteens. But actually, my project for this year is like, how can you like teach yourself to really run slow? But it's hard. Yeah, it is <laughs> yeah really, really hard. hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, one thing like that when you talk, I mean, you think from the, the outside of for, professional triathlete it's just how much training time you need but that is balanced against I mean like how do you how do you stop yourself from overtraining to feel like I've done this much so more has to be better yeah I think that ultimately like that's why I needed a coach and probably why I still need a coach so um I like I said I'm very I would say one of my weaknesses is like having a governor because I think I'm always someone as like this type A driven athlete who's competitive that like wants more and thinks more is more. Um, and so I think as like an overall athlete or whatever that um, Jesse did a great job of like holding me back when I needed to be held back and then pushing me when I needed to be pushed. And I will say like, I should interject since this is like talk with a pro that like, I, I was extremely fortunate. And I realize that now that like, I didn't have to work. So for me, training was my work. Racing was work for me. And I think, um, someone like that, again, like I don't have any regrets on my career, but I, I became very one dimensional, particularly like towards the end of my career. I think early on with Jesse and in the first eight years and even probably the first four years of working with Jesse, like it worked out great that like all I did was eat, breathe and sleep, swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, you know, repeat nutrition recovery. But um, I, again, like you can't have regrets that I didn't like work another job in between, but I think the tendency to like more is more can be even greater when it's like, this is all you're doing. So um, yeah. <laughs> so once you, I mean, it sounds like you talked to Jesse in November. So this must yeah. have been post a post Kona conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was there something that happened at Kona that year that triggered you to say, I need to do something different? Or was it just yeah. four years at this time? Yeah, like, yeah. No, I had been injured going into Kona that year. So that was when I sort of started to see this chink in the ar armor. I had a bone stress um, in a lower leg injury. So I didn't run much going into Kona. And then I started working with a physiotherapist in Bend, Oregon at the time. And he was like, you're racing Kona. You've been injured. I need you to like fully come on board with my run program. If you want to stand a chance to run a marathon off of basically zero run training. And so I really invested in this program that Jay at the, his name is Jay um, had prescribed me and we had to kind of lean a bit away from what purple patch was prescribing. And so I really doubled down on the strength training and this whole rehab and like, how can you run a marathon off a of very low mileage? And, um, that year in Kona, I placed 10 and my longest run before the race was eight miles. <laughs> and I ran a three Oh three marathon, I think. Wow. And all of a sudden this light bulb went off. Like there's more than one way to skin a cat. Like you've been training this one way and all of a sudden here's this fresh energy and these ideas and training that's completely different than all you've known. And look at this amazing result you had. And so, yeah, I knew the minute I was done in Kona that year that um, some changes needed to be made. And so, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I was like researching code. Actually, yeah, we went to Maui on holiday. And I'm sure, I don't know what it's like from a coach, but I'm sure like the week after Kona coaches inboxes are like 
<laughs> every <laughs> athlete sitting there scratching their head of what went wrong. What can I do different? What can I do better? So, um, yeah, I reached out to Jesse pretty much, I'm sure right after Kona and said, would you be interested in talking? Okay. So, um, I think you said that was 2013. You started yeah. 2013 was your full season. And then how long did you end up working with Jesse as your coach? Basically, I mean, even still, does that count? I mean, not really, but I definitely text him questions every now and then. But um, formally, we worked basically together all the way to the end. Um, the very end, he was a bit more of an advisor versus um, early on in our career was definite. Like I did what Jesse said, just put it in a Darrow, put it in training peaks. Sometimes I did not follow the plan to a T, but I like, Jesse was driving the ship. I wasn't questioning anything. I would just keep my mouth shut and do the workouts. Sometimes I would add on shocking. <laughs> and then Jesse would get upset with me as much as he can. But yeah, for the most part though, Jesse was directing everything. And then, like I said, I think towards the end, I wanted to have a bit more ownership um, of what was going on. And so I was trying to provide input and Jesse was directing the ship a bit, but, um, yeah, so all the way through. <laughs> so, I mean, you over, over your career and your 17 years, how many times did you go to Kona? Um, I went 15. So yeah. Um, there was one year I had a broken femur, um, a femoral neck stress fracture. So I didn't get to race that year and then COVID. So I went every year that I could, <laughs> which is crazy to like even think of. Um, but yeah, so I did Kona every time. <laughs> so what did you think of, I mean, this year in 2023 with it being an all women's field, what did you? Yeah. It was so, it's so, I mean, I never had the opportunity to race it as an all women's event. I had, um, towards the end of the year, they implemented these pro races where they were either all men's or all women's events. And I was a huge fan of that because they basically, again, I know I say that finances weren't a driver for me, but I was curious slash looking, but um, with these all women's events, they were taking the men's prize money and giving it to the women. So the last few Ironmans I won were actually all women's Ironman events. And the pay was great because you were basically not only getting normal payday, but also the men's prize money too. Um, and vice versa, the men's were getting the women's when it was a men's only race. So I was, I had gotten a taste of what the all women's events were like, and I was really intrigued by it, but we still had age group men racing around us. So um, I'm a bit bummed that I didn't get the opportunity to race at a different venue such as Nice or, or Kona as an all women's race. But um, I don't have huge strong opinions on it. Like I feel like we are not in the driver's seat, you know, and it's kind of like you race what you're, what you're given and what the opportunities are, but um, what a cool opportunity for women in sport. And I think um, we didn't preface this, but I do a lot of the, or I help out, I should say, I actually play a very minor role in the marketing for QT2. And I think leading into the all women's Kona event, some of us on the marketing side were a bit, I don't know how this is going to work out. And then from the sidelines looking in, like, I think it exceeded my expectations and it definitely made me think like, God, you know, I wish I was there. Um, I think that it um, was really well done. So I, yeah, I'm really excited to see where it goes. And I hope that the momentum headed into maybe a more challenging race like Nice uh, stays there. So, um, so in the time that you worked with, with Desi, so from 2014 to 2022, talk about some of your, your memorable race experiences during that, that timing. Oh man. So many, I will say, um, to continue on with my Jesse story, I went to the QT2 Florida camp. Um, we started working together in December, February is here before you know it. I would say at that time, like I knew very little about QT2 and I went to probably one of the last Florida camps that carries the rumored stories about the crazy workouts we did. And it literally was a boot camp for me. <laughs> I mean, I was not fit at all compared to anyone. I knew nothing really about QT2. And, you know, you live with a bunch of other QT2 athletes. So one of my roommates was coach Vinny. 
Um, Pat Wheeler was one of my roommates. Beth Shutt was one of my roommates. Um, Cindy, who's no longer with QT2, but they just treated me like family and like took me under their wing. And it was like, here's how the core diet works. Like, here's how you feel after a workout. Uh, you know, we get a call at 8 PM that we're doing, we're running a marathon that night in the middle of the night. Like, what do I eat? What do I bring? And they all just like welcomed me into their fold. Um, oh, Kim Schwabenbauer was there and we became really just all of us bonded for life over a lot of sweat and, and tears. And it was, I was very out of shape at that camp. I didn't think I realized it at the time, but then everyone else was like running zone one circles around me. But, um, I think two or three weeks later, I went and won Ironman Cabo. So that was a pretty cool. And like, even people at the camp were joking with me, like, you have no business winning this race. <laughs> like, how did you win this race? This is not the athlete that we just saw at camp. But I think a lot of it was just, I had this crazy quick learning curve about the QT2 me methodology and just like leaving no stone unturned and, and Cabo turned into a day that was like made for QT2 athletes, like very hot. You got to pay attention to details. Pacing means everything. Um, so I think winning an Ironman within six months of working with Jesse, like I had zero questions after that. It was like, okay, this is going to work out just great. <laughs> so that was a, a very memorable race. Um, we set the American record, which was very cool at Ironman Austria. Um, so I raced there once the first year and I went very fast. And then this, I went back the next year and broke the American record and went eight hours and 42 minutes. And um, that was all under Jesse. And yeah, that was a highlight. And then later that year I did Kona. And then I won Ironman Arizona that same year. So it was kind of like a, I set the record in Austria. I was top 10 in Kona and then won Ironman Arizona. And that was definite, um, probably peaking in my career, um, as an athlete and just, uh, just great memories. Um, a race that didn't go well. I raced Ironman Ireland, um, towards the end of my career. And somehow I convinced Jesse and Chrissy that they needed to come to Ireland. <laughs> And Ireland was amazing until the race. And then it proceeded to rain so much and I got hypothermic and similar to what we talked about, I think at the start of the call, but I was like, I couldn't even see straight. And so I pulled out and didn't finish the race. And again, like it's, I was so disappointed. And then I have all this guilt that like my coach and his wife flew over to support me. And I couldn't get the job done. And like on paper, it was a race I totally should have won. Um, but, you know, like when someone genuinely cares and, and is supportive of you, like they were like, they didn't care. Like they just wanted to go drink Guinness in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a lot of, yeah, I mean, too many, I could spend hours talking about all the highlights, but um, at the end, I think we won maybe five or six different Ironmans um, together, working together. and um a lot of races uh Jesse raced uh 100k I think his first ultra marathon and somehow Chrissy and I got talked well Chrissy would be a given but we went and crewed it for him so it was pretty cool to like be on the other side and, and be helping Jesse with with some of his goals um uh oh one year um he, uh, he had a few athletes racing Ironman Coeur d'Alene and I actually wasn't racing that year and so to play support person with Jesse. We, we had a lot of fun that year. So yeah, I could go on and on <laughs> trips down memory lane. <laughs> so what, um, what made you decide to retire? Oh man. I don't, I, I mean, you hear all the time that like, when you know, you know, and I was like, ah, whatever. <laughs> and I think COVID changed a lot for me. I initially, I thought like in my head, I would race 15 Konas and I would retire then. And that would have been Kona or that would have been the year of COVID. Um, I knew with COVID that I was getting towards the end of just, I was asking Jesse for different workouts. I was looking for new motivation. Um, so I was kind of starting to get towards the end of my rope. And when COVID happened, I basically 
was like, I need to treat this like a sabbatical. I don't want to do the virtual races. I don't want to stay motivated. I want to just take a step back. And that was the first time in like 15 years that this person, myself, who only knew swim, bike, run, all of a sudden had my eyes open to like, I have this wonderful husband. I have this great dog. I live in a beautiful place. Like I can say yes to like so many things that I wasn't able to say yes to before. And there was a real shift with COVID where before COVID, uh, my husband, Chris, and we've been together for 20 some 20 plus years, but before COVID, he would be like, I'm going fishing and camping for the weekend. And I would be like, great. I'm going on a seven hour ride. I'm sitting in my Norma tech boots. I'm eating my rice. I'm eating my eggs, going to bed at 7 PM, sitting in my Epsom salt, going to go do a two hour run the next day. Like didn't even miss that he was gone. Didn't even wonder what was happening out there. And then COVID hit and all of a sudden I was going and doing what he was doing and, and realizing that there's this whole world outside of, of triathlon. Um, and then when it came time to come back from COVID, um, from a financial end, I was very fortunate that my sponsors didn't cut any pay during COVID. And a lot of my contracts carried over slash extended, like extended so much grace that it's like, you didn't get to raise, we're going to keep sponsoring you even after, you know? And so I, that was the first time that it felt like a job where it's like, I want to go see what Chris is doing this weekend. And all of a sudden, like sitting home and doing the seven hour ride in my Norma Tex is like, not, I'm just, yeah, it just didn't sound as much fun to me as it once was. So I, I have this visual of like a rope and being at the end of the rope. And I think at the end of my career, I definitely was like towards the end of the rope. And um, I think looking back, like I got everything out of myself. <laughs> like every last drop because this last year, just looking at like what I've, um, letting my body heal, letting my mind heal. I was like, wow, okay. You were definitely pretty maxed out, tapped out there at the end. So, um, I would say it probably was just longevity of doing the sport at such a high level for so long. I definitely will say I was pretty burnt out at the end. Um, which is kind of a bummer to like hear or feel with like a sport that gave you so much, but, um, I needed some, and I needed my body's like, I need recovery. <laughs> you can't do Kona 15 times and not pay a price for it slash all the other Ironmans. I mean, I definitely did over 30 Ironmans. So that's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. Um, and so, I mean, you've touched on this a little bit as we've been talking, but I mean, when you worked as, as a pro, you mm -hmm. didn't anything else. So you had to sustain your, your life on what you made. So how did you, what sources of income did you have? Yeah. As so I mean, as a pro for me, I got income from basically almost three different ways. Um, one was from racing. So you would get prize money from races, which probably actually, believe it or not, was almost the smallest amount you would make. And then the second was, um, basically all my sponsors paid me a retainer or a salary. So you'd get a retainer throughout the year. So you'd be living off that. And then the third way would be bonuses. So if you won an Ironman, you would get bonuses from each sponsor and the bonus structures look different for each sponsor. So some sponsors would only pay you if you won. Other sponsors would be very supportive and we're going to pay you up to fifth place. Um, some sponsors would talk through it with you of like, do you want to go all in on yourself? And like, we're going to pay you a lot greater if you win, or you can choose, you would get to choose which bonus structure. And so you're kind of like, do I want to bet on myself and go big and like hope that I win or, um, so yeah, those were kind of the three ways of making money, um, were basically bonuses from race results, um, the salary stipends, and then the prize earnings. Okay. So from the, the, the sponsorship standpoint, um, did your sponsors at any, like any time dictate which races you ended up doing or creative? No. Yeah, it was all, I, again, I feel like now that I look back and hear stories and talk to people, I feel very lucky, but yeah, nothing was ever dictated, but for sure, when you see a bonus structure that maybe is geared more towards Ironman racing, like uh, at the time, like Rev3 was out there or even the start of PTO. And a lot of my sponsors were like, that's not where the marketing is. Those races aren't as important to me. So 
I think I focused a lot on the Ironman racing and Ironman series just because, um, because of that, but no one was ever like, you have to go race this. Um, again, though, a lot of the sponsorships, I ended up working with the agent only a year and then all my sponsors were like, I'd rather work with you than an agent. And you make such little money that like, what, why would you pay that money towards an agent? So, um, I did my husband and I together did all my contracts, but with those, you're able to talk directly with the sponsor. So one year, one of my sponsors said, we really want to make a presence in Europe. If we gave you a bonus structure that um, says you set the American record in Europe, would you be willing to like go try to do that? And I happened to that year and it was like, I won the lottery. <laughs> I mean, it felt like I won the lottery, like that it would actually work out like that. But no, nothing was ever dictated of where I had to race. So, so did you have obligations that you, that you needed to do like as an athlete, as part of the contracts other than um, race? Yeah. I mean, most of them are like, you have to race the minimum number of times. A lot of them are like, you needed a logo on a Jersey mm -hmm. towards the end when social media started to play more of a part in contracts. I actually tried to be pretty savvy about staying away from these incentives. Like if you post an affiliate link, you'll get X percentage of cuts. Um, for me, like telling my story in an authentic way was really important to me. And I just felt that when other people posted affiliate links, I just kind of glazed over my eyes and I would not be that engaged with it. And so I would say I actually kind of dug my heels in when sponsors would approach to be like, we want to put in the contract that you have to post X number of times. But I think that from talking to people that that's more common now. Um, I just, um, if I were talking to a pro that was looking at contracts now, I would just say to be leery or cautious of like, um, what direction you want to, and, and everyone's different. Some people make a lot of money off of affiliate codes, but for me, it was nothing. I, I, I'm a horrible salesperson, <laughs> I feel like. So I never wanted to be in a position of like, I need to sell bikes or product. I want to just be myself and do my thing and hope that that's enough to, to represent your company well. So, um, yeah, there weren't any major obligations other than like, you know, you have to race, maybe you have to do a few expos or photo shoots or kind of extra things. But, um, yeah, for the most part, it was all, um, I mean, there's fine print in a contract, but it, I felt pretty lucky that I wasn't too constricted on what I had to return. Okay. Um, so what's life been like since you retired other than catching up on your sleep and yeah. <laughs> recovering your body? So yeah, yeah. Like yeah, I feel so lucky. It's been such a smoother transition than I was anticipating. And I think that like, even towards the end, I had long talks with Jesse about like fearing, you know, everyone talks about how hard retirement is. I mean, I talked about it earlier that like, all I know is this go hard mentality and this like more is more. And, and for years you wake up, you look at your training peaks and that's what you do, you know? Um, but I think maybe, I mean, my story was meant to be how it was. And I think that I was so burnt out towards the end that um, now it's been such a great year because I literally, I joked that last year was my year of yes, where it was like, I'm going to say yes to like base. I think I only said no to like three things last year, but it was like, if an opportunity comes my way, like I want to be able to say yes to it. Um, and so I feel really lucky that it has been a great, you know, like people have backdoored me and like gone to Chris and been like, no, really like, how's she doing? And, and yeah, I, I even like, I worked with a sports psychologist and towards the end of my career, when we were talking about retirement, I was like, I just don't know, like thinking back of like, holding banners over my head and, and winning an Ironman. Like there's no greater feeling than that in the whole world. And it's a, it's a huge adrenaline rush. I will agree. There's no like greater feeling, but I think my biggest fear was like, I'll never feel fulfillment. Like I felt on that day at Ironman Wisconsin ever again. And like within months of retiring, it's like a moment here, a moment there, a moment here, a moment there. And you're like, okay, there's like this whole other world to live outside of racing. So it's been a really enjoyable um, transition for me. So I feel, I feel really grateful. And there's, I mean, definitely a few things I miss, but I think that 
the things that have been added to my cup kind of make up for the fact that like, um, I can't run 10 by a mile at six minute pace anymore, <laughs> but maybe <laughs> someday. <laughs> Do you think if you had tried to live all of those things when you were racing as a pro, you would have been as effective as a pro? You know, that's tough. Like I think Jesse, a lot of the times was like, this girl needs a bit more balance in her life. And same with the sports psychologist, like, let's try to not be so one dimensional. And like, even Chris, I, Chris pushed really hard of like you, Chris is my husband of like, we got to figure out what retirement's going to look like. What are you going to do? Like he was just trying to set me up for success. And I, I only knew racing with blinders on. I only knew training with blinders on. I, to, for me personally, I didn't have the capacity to like work, you know, like even QT2, like I was trying to like do some stuff for QT2 on the side. Like maybe I could coach, maybe I could help with marketing. And it was like, nope, all I, like my DNA was just like, I need to race and like only focus on that. Um, so, I mean, I, again, I don't have regrets. I just know who I am as a person, but I look at some people that have a bit more life balance than I have. And you're like, I don't know, would that have helped me? You know, like I, I do think towards the end of my career, maybe things would have been a bit more enjoyable. I wouldn't have been um, so hard on myself. I think that that was probably one of my detriments was just being really, really hard on myself. And if you were to talk to Jesse and ask for a report card, he'd probably say that I was too hard on myself. So I think if maybe I'd had that life balance or these other buckets that were being filled, um, that yeah, maybe I would have been a bit kinder to myself, but I don't know. <laughs> so, so would you do it again? Oh yeah. In a minute. I mean, an opportunity to like travel the world, push yourself to like incredible feats of strength. I also have like so much respect now. <laughs> like if I were to try to do a QT2 workout, like proper, like Ironman, I don't even, what do I, yeah, I would, it wouldn't even be possible. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so many lessons learned that are applicable in so many other areas of my life. And um, I mean, I would say kudos to Jesse. He was a part of my life through a lot of really formative years. Um, I would say I was pretty, um, young, young, young still, um, when we met and I did a lot of growing up under, under Jesse and he was a huge part of that. So I'm really grateful. So I have one, one more question for you, <laughs> which is if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? I think it's probably the like Jesse Kropelnicki mantra, which is like, don't think just do. You know, like if you have the opportunity, you got to go for it. Um, don't overanalyze things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you don't know unless you try and, and you just got to go for it. And I mean, I think there was a theme early on when I was talking about like I exceeded my expectations and then I exceeded them again, you know, and I think a lot of that came from that, like, don't think you just do. You just got to execute. Um, so that was a theme that really helped me out through whether it was a tough workout or a tough season of life. And, and I even still use it now, but, um, I would definitely like say that to someone that's like, should I do it? Should I not? It's like, just do it. You don't know, unless you try, you know, like I said, I was the, I literally was a kid that was like, I'm only going to do Kona once and, and like, look what happened from it. So yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk yeah. today. It was really interesting just hearing more about, about your experience, your life and, and having this conversation. So really appreciate it. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah.